Well, welcome everybody to America's oldest net positive home remodel. Uh, we're going to be talking about how they um, accomplish this and learn a little bit of lessons on how you can do that too. Um, this program is uh, registered um, for continuing education through the National Association of Remodeling Institute for Green, um, GVCI, um, and AIA. Um, this program is brought to you by the Green Home Institute, um, recently, uh, or formerly the Alliance for Environmental Sustainability. Um, we were founded in 2000 as the Alliance, and now we're the Green Home Institute. Uh, we are the Midwest Lead for Homes provider. We are a 501c3 nonprofit um, with a key mission of providing education tools, uh, resources um, to both homeowners and professionals for um, greener, healthier, uh, more high-performance homes. Uh, we, as I said, we're the Lead for Homes provider with over 10,000 projects registered, nearly 5,000 certified uh, homes and multifamily units across the Midwest. Um, we do want to give a quick shout out to our Platinum Plus sponsor, Anderson Windows, um, for all of their support of the Institute. Uh, to get involved um, with the Green Home Institute, you can become a member, become a sponsor, um, volunteer, intern watch several different kinds of free recorded webinars that are on demand, um, and uh, submit professional articles or blogs. Uh, one thing that I wanted to uh, uh, first uh, sort of uh, announce here publicly is the, um, the gold green star certification of Matt Grokoff's house. Um, uh, before we get into this presentation, I, I did want to announce that um, and, and, and say uh, Matt has achieved the highest level of the Green Star Remodeling Certification Program. Um, he is the first um, in Michigan uh, to receive this certification um, in the gold, uh, the second project in Michigan to receive um, uh, the certification. And actually, this certification program started in Minnesota, uh, and so this is the second home outside of Minnesota uh, in the Midwest to receive um, uh, the Green Star program. If you want to learn more about Green Star and how you can use it as guidance on your next remodeling project, um, you can go to Green starhome.org uh, and access the free webinars uh, and uh, checklist and manual uh, all at no cost. Um, one thing that's uh, also, or one thing to note, uh, I remember being in Matt's house wrapping up his certification a couple of weeks ago, and he said, um, you know, he wishes he had a, a resource like this before he before he started any kind of his work. So, um, you know, uh, don't don't jump into it uh, into green over your head. Just use um, use the resource um, as a way to guide your next project. Um, and another exciting thing is is Matt's project uh, is the Green Star Verified Net Zero Energy Remodel, and it's one of the first um, independently verified net zero projects um, in the Midwest. So without further ado, I'm going to um, hand it off to Matt here. Uh, Matt uh, uh, Grokoff, he is with uh, Thrive uh, Net Zero uh, Consulting, um, helping folks uh, go net zero um in, in their projects and net positive he is with uh, lawrence tech living building studio uh, design advisor and a lecturer he is a u of m um, uh, Uni uh, university of michigan uh, advisor and um, his house uh, through the u of m blue lab uh, received a grant from both uh, the ford foundation and Dow to help achieve, um, to do research to help him achieve um, not just net zero energy, uh, but now his next tackle is the net zero uh, water certification. Uh, Matt lives in Ann Arbor with his uh, uh, wife and two children. So with that, I'll hand it off to you, Matt, thanks. All right, so Brett, you see my screen? I do. Oh, fantastic. So much easier this way. So yeah, so I'm just gonna get right into it for, um, I. I there's a couple of names that I saw that I do recognize on here, and uh, some of y'all have, have seen me talk at uh, at uh, conferences around the country, uh, or at different businesses and uh, keynotes and things like that. Uh, but today, I'm going to do something a little different than I've normally done. Uh, for a long time, people have been saying, "Hey, we more we would like to see just kind of a a how to uh, uh, do net zero on your house and." Uh, and my answer to that was always that I, I can't really tell you, my house isn't going to tell you how to become a net zero house. 
Um, what I can do is tell you what we did. And now that we've completed a year of data for documentation through Green Star and for and through the uh, the International Living Futures Institute, uh, we're also we're about to be certified as uh, one of the fourth uh, the uh, the fourth uh, net zero home uh, on the planet through the Inter International Living Future Institute and uh, uh, the second uh, in the uh, in in the country and the first in the in the Midwest and the first in a cold climate. So the other ones were kind of cheating by being in places like uh, Austin, Texas, um, <laughs> but uh, they do get 100 degree plus days too. So, but what we what um, uh, what my friend Sunshine Mathan did in Austin, Texas, the strategies uh, were uh, very similar to what we did, although the tactics were quite different because it was a different climate zone. So I'm just going to kind of go through this stuff, just tell you the story about our house. And uh, and then try to save as much time for questions as we can. So this is uh this is in 2006. This was the house that my wife and I ran by, and we said, "Holy crap, that is our dream house!" Right? Look at that—the plywood front porch, the asbestos siding, everything that you could ever want. It had zero insulation in the attic, except for a layer of newspaper dated 1902. Uh, and uh, but what what better to keep you warm than a section in the newspaper on the timely thoughts for earnest women? It's a great way to insulate a house. We had lead paint on all of the walls. We had windows, the original windows. Um, only two of them could be opened when we moved in. They were all painted shut. Uh, they didn't have uh, operable uh, locks or uh, anything else, but yet you could stick a spatula all the way through every single one of the windows. So they wouldn't open, but they leaked like hell. We had carpet on all of the 100-year-old 100, uh, you know, 100 hard pine floors. We had a refrigerator from 1989 in the kitchen. We had a gas stove. We had um, toilets that flushed, or uh, one toilet that flushed five gallons per minute. We had uh, no shower in the house, uh, uh, and we had the uh, the nice little pink towel shower curtains in the back there with the uh, the pink formica on the walls. We had uh, the the faucets were running at uh, you know uh, uh, two and a half to three gallons per minute. Um, we had a Mueller Climatrol furnace down in the basement. It was probably 47% efficient and was installed in 1957. This thing was never going to die, but cost us about $350 a month to use in the winter. And that was just to keep the, the heat at, uh, at 62 degrees. And we had buckwheat pillows heated up in the microwave and stuffed at the bottom of two down comforters while we went to bed with um, sweatpants and a sweatshirt. And for that, we had the privilege of paying DTE. And then we took a house that uh, looked like this one day, and we, a year later, we won a Historic Preservation Award. Uh, and then not only did we restore the house according to the uh, National Trust for Historic Preservation Standards, but we made it net zero energy. And now we're on target to be, uh, like I said, the fourth certified home on the planet uh, through the International Living, for, uh, Living Nas International Living Future Institute. Uh, so with that, we went out to I went out to uh, start Thrive Net Zero Consulting, and we just started a company in Detroit, uh, Polymath Development, which is to harvest material from the city in order to rehab existing buildings uh, to net zero energy or full living building status. Uh, the house has gotten tons and tons of attention. We've been in USA Today and in, in, in all kinds of magazines on Fox Business News. I was called the, the, the all electric innovator, uh, the proven zero energy master. This is one of my favorites. Um, I, I sometimes make my wife call, call me the energy master at night. Uh, we have been in several books. Uh, I actually just learned of another book that I didn't even know we were going to be in. So that's the, the fourth book that this house has been highlighted in. Uh, I was on Fox uh, a number of times on their energy team, and and I actually got to tell them that look, this isn't about insulation, it's not about solar panels, it's all about love and happiness. And they actually invited me to come back as long as I didn't wear Birkenstocks. And uh, I've gotten to come and speak at Google, uh, Green Build several times, International Living Future Institute, all these conferences. My Ford Magazine put my family in their centerfold. They did a whole spread about us, and uh, called me the you know the number one electric innovator. And I said, hey, this is a really neat car. This is going to change the future. Can I, can I drive your prototype that you've got parked on our lawn? And, uh, and they said no. Uh, so I said, screw you. And we went out and bought a Chevy Volt. And uh, there's our Chevy Volt charged into our little G watt station uh, uh, charger, charging up with a tank full of sunshine. And so with the excess solar, uh, we uh, go uh, for up to about 1,000 miles a year in, uh, in the Chevy Volt uh, powered from, from the sun. 
and we do plan on over there on the right side you see uh, we've got a little bit of space left on the uh, kitchen roof that we're going to be adding some solar panels to uh, uh, eventually power the full electric vehicle. I was invited to give a TED talk, uh, How to Destroy the Planet from the Comfort of Your Own Home. Uh, we're USA Today called the house one of the best greenhouses in America. Uh, lifestyle greener than grass is what somebody called us. I got an environmental awareness award, which is incredibly flattering because uh, there's a really low bar here. They're giving awards now just for being aware of the environment. And the Atlantic called us the most flattering thing of all, sustainable perfection. But uh, I, I wasn't quite sure about sustainable perfection. And so I've got a, a little secret to share with you about all this stuff that it's all bullshit. There's no such thing as a sustainable building. There's not a single thing that can be sustainable. There is no such thing as a sustainable flower, a sustainable tree, a sustainable whale, human, or a building. Because all of life is sustained by these underlying networks. Uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, who is the father of fractal geometry, said that, that you think not of what you see, but what it took to produce what you see. So we look at things like the, the human circulatory system. It's got 60,000 miles of plumbing. 60,000 miles of plumbing. There's not a single straight line. And it's powered by a pump, the human heart, that uses less than two watts. This is an extraordinary thing because nature builds things very, very differently than we do. Throughout nature, everything is networked. Nothing is built in straight lines. Everything is interconnected and it all mimics the same pattern over and over again throughout the universe. So instead of designing these little boxes, we really have to figure out how do we design for complexity? And, and uh, this is the big what, right? How do we design for complexity? And uh, I like big what's, and I cannot lie, as Mick, uh, Sir mix a -Lot once said. So the, the, so the big what for us and for this conversation is really net zero energy. And, and what our house is proving and what I think a number of these other net zero houses that are coming online are starting to prove is that net zero energy is not a challenge. It's a choice. When I, I, was, I was at the first uh, net positive energy and water conference in uh, San Francisco last January, and we split off into several project teams from around the world, which included people from Lebanon and uh, China and all over the world uh, with different projects. And, and when asked, uh, all right, which teams would like to go over here and talk about energy and which teams would like to talk about water? Not a single team said they wanted to talk about energy because every one of these teams that had been working on this felt like energy was not an issue. This was something that they could do very easily with off the shelf technology water was going to be the real challenge. So that's one of the biggest points I would like everybody to take home now that this is this is not only possible, it's necessary, we need to do it, and it's actually not that difficult. Um, so James Hansen said that you know, stabilizing atmospheric CO2 and climate requires that net CO2 emissions approach zero by 2030 to 2050. Now, if you look at this word I underlined, it says required. It doesn't say that this is a suggestion. In other words, in order to maintain the biosphere that we have adapted to, that all of the species that we rely on have adapted to, we are required to stop using carbon. Stop using carbon. Near zero is what they're talking about. So not only is net zero energy possible, but it is an absolute necessity. It's something that we have to do. This is a neat little photograph because this is a uh, this was the Philip Gauss Saloon. We actually bought our house in uh, uh, in 2006 from the Gauss family. Uh, Gert Gauss's father was Philip Gauss, and this was this was his saloon. But the photograph is neat because this was the day. If you look up at the top of the screen, the guys hanging from the utility wires, they were installing electricity to the old West Side neighborhood in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on this day. Before this time, anybody on the Old West Side or anybody before they were wired with this, this, this magical power had to get energy from right in front of them. If they wanted heat, they had to have a match and light a fire right in front of them. <clears throat> if they wanted to cook, they had to burn it right there. The energy source was immediate and local. This was the first time that we were able to burn things remotely. You could flick a switch and somewhere off in the distance, coal would light up and send electricity through these wires into your home. So we really need to reconnect with the way we look at energy. 
So the living building challenge with their net, wa net, net zero water and with their net zero energy and their living building challenge, um, they use the metaphor of the flower because the, 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 a flower is rooted in place, just like a building is. So we really need to start looking at these place-based solutions. A flower, like a building, uh, needs to harvest all of its own energy, all of its own water. It's adapted to its own climate. It's adapted to its site. And it operates completely pollution-free. Any waste is, is food for other things around it. And it's integrated. And most of all, it's beautiful. Um, and we can't forget that we need to make our buildings beautiful. They shouldn't be thermoses out, out in the middle of a field. So what is net zero energy? The International Living Future Institute defines it <coughs> as, um, as basically 100% of all of the energy that you use on site has to be offset with 100% of the renewable energy produced on site. For net positive energy under the under the full living building certification, it's actually 105%, which accounts for some of that variability um, from year to year. Um, so it's pretty simple. And more importantly, combustion is not allowed in, uh, in any of the living building net zero energy projects. And our house doesn't have it. That's our old meter. We had DT come by and remove that meter, and uh, the, the guy from DTE told us that it was the first time in his 22 years of working for DTE that he had ever removed a meter. He's, he's disconnected people, but he's never actually removed it. He said, well, what about when you want the gas again? I said, we will never want natural gas again. And so what's the problem with con combustion? Why isn't combustion allowed, um, and why don't we have it in our house anymore? This is just one example of one of the problems with clean natural gas. Uh, Google has partnered with the Environmental Defense Fund and installed into their Google Maps trucks technology, I believe, it's from the um, uh, from University of Colorado uh, that uh, measures methane as the truck is driving around. So in Boston, they uh, did one of their first pilot study. They drove around through all the streets, finding detectable levels of methane. Here in the yellow, what you're seeing. Is, is a little circle, each one of those circles in yellow is, is, the, is the amount of methane that uh, would be the equivalent carbon of uh, 100 to 1,000 miles of an automobile driving every single year. The orange ones, and you can see there's quite a few of them, are 1,000 to 9,000 miles every day of an automobile. That's how much methane is leaking from our urban infrastructures to deliver this natural gas. That's not to mention the the, the sourcing of the natural gas in Wyoming and, and uh, uh, in North Dakota and other places. And there's a few places you see there in red, which are 9,000 miles equivalent. And methane is 85 times more potent than CO2 in the short term up in the atmosphere. So this is a pretty serious issue. Um, so what is possible with an all electric house built in 1901? Uh, so from July 15th of 2013, Till today, uh, or till last month, uh, we used uh, 9,089 kilowatts of electricity. We produced 9,840, and that was a surplus of 751 kilowatt hours uh, per year, or, or over that 13-month period. Uh, this is what that looked like uh, for our certification data for the for the Living Future Institute. Um, you can see this uh, in the red is our energy use. In the yellow, that's energy production. You can see right there in January, right at the center of the screen, where that red spikes like crazy. That's our polar vortex winter, where we had temperatures, you know, as low as 38, minus 38 wind chill uh, for several days. There were several days where the temperature did not go over zero Fahrenheit here in Ann Arbor, despite that uh, record breaking cold and record breaking snowfall, we were still able to come up over the year with a surplus of 263 kilowatt hours. And that's what our bill looks like in August uh, of this year, from August 13th. Uh, we have an account balance of uh, minus $399.20. And uh, this bill, this month's bill was 93, minus $93. That was the check that we received in the mail the day we brought our new daughter home from the hospital on the first day of spring. So that was a pretty sweet moment thinking that uh, this little girl is uh, one of the first of her generation to grow up in a net zero energy home that consumes no carbon and, is un and has no combustion. 
So over 30 years of the life of our mortgage, we will have shifted $283,000 in costs by doing this. So what does a net zero energy house look like, right? Everyone assumes, and there are books that talk about this, you have to have this uh, freaky deaky experiment with lots of solar panels on the roof, with, with R40 in the walls, R30 in the floor, R100 in the attic, <coughs> with these really, really extreme things. But the reality is, our 114-year-old home uh, has R13 in the walls. If you add the clapboard siding and the plaster, we get about R15. In the attic, we have R29 of, of, of open cell spray foam insulation. In the basement, we also did uh, uh, a little bit of on the, on the rim joist to seal that up. We restored the existing windows. So we have the existing single pane windows, and we just put storms on there. So we reduced our air infiltration by quite a bit. You can see that from a 4,400 CFM in the blower door uh, at, a, at, uh, at uh, you know, 50 pascals down to 1330 with the storm windows on, which gave us an ACH of about 4.75. Now, the new code under IECC for 2012 says that you need to have, un that new buildings should have under three ACH 50. So we're not even a code built house at this point, And yet we're able to achieve net zero energy. Our HER score was 37, which everyone says, wow, that's really great. HER score was 37, but that's 37 points off of what our data actually shows us. So the HER score is really taking a look at the envelope and everything else, but not really looking at how we use energy in the home. And there's a big, big lesson to learn from this single piece of data that it's not necessarily about the envelope. So what is this big secret? So which, which one of these, um, there's no way we can raise hands here, but I ask this question all the time now, is which one of these uses more energy? This, this old Victorian home or this energy efficient light bulb LED on the right side of the screen? Uh, and the answer everyone seems to think is, obviously it's the LED light bulb uses less than the whole house does. But the answer is that buildings don't use any energy. The, uh, the, the, uh, all the crap inside them does. So the, the shell of a building does not consume any energy. The shell of a building, the envelope, is really just a tool for your HVAC. It's to hold in the energy on the side of the building that it needs to be. Uh, uh, that's all it does. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just the jacket for your home. Crucial, vital component of net zero energy and yet it's not the only thing. So we look at this thing, would I make a distinction between the building design and behavioral design? Because what we end up doing is blaming the occupant. It's the occupant's fault. Look, I built this great shell of a house. Why isn't it net zero? Well, it's because the owner, it's, it's their fault. And maybe instead of blaming the occupant, we ought to be blaming the, 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 the grandmas in uh, California or with their swollen joints smoking the miracle marijuana because miracle marijuana a single kilo of indoor grown greenhouse medical marijuana is has the equivalent carbon output to driving a toyota prius for a year uh berkeley did a study where they've just found that three percent of california's electricity now goes to indoor grow houses maybe we uh, what we really need is is start uh, lead certifying the uh, the grow houses for these things and, and this really has nothing to do with my talk, but I just thought that was such, such a fascinating piece of information that I had to share it with you all. So the secret is that it's not just about the envelopes. We need to look at other stuff. So one of the primary things with net zero energy that I think a lot of folks are missing is, is the, uh, the, 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 the first step uh, when I've sat down with design teams is they all say, it's like, well, first, let's get all the CBEX data and let's find out what the HERS rating is of other uh, other commercial buildings or residential homes in the area and see how we compare to those. And and then we want to reduce the energy from that by 70% and yada, yada, yada. And, and that's absolutely not the way any of these successful net zero energy buildings have done this. What they've done is ignored all historic buildings and said, look, we're not going to pay attention to how they are performing. We're going to look to things that helped in those. We're going to look to technologies. But first, what we do is we start with our rooftop. How much are we capable? So this is a case study that was done by the Bullet Center, which is a um, uh, <coughs> a full service uh, leased office building with grade A office space uh, in uh, in downtown Seattle. This property goes sidewalk to sidewalk. It's uh, five stories tall. 
and it is net zero energy, net zero water, and net zero waste, and will be and is uh, under documentation for full living building certification. Uh, there, the way they started, and the way that uh, any successful net zero energy project, including our own, starts is like, well, how much energy do I need? So this is a typical building. So if you start comparing yourself to a typical home or typical Seattle office building, as the Bullet Center did, this is the size solar array they would need to get to 72 kBTU a square foot. Uh, it would cover half the half the neighborhood. Um, if they wanted to uh, meet energy code, this would be the size panel they would need, and they would have to target 51 kBTU a, K, a kBTU a square foot. If they wanted to be a lead platinum building, they would need an array this size, still hanging over the, the adjacent park and the neighboring buildings next door, 32. So they realized that this building was capable of producing uh, in an area of 14,000 square feet, and they would need to have an energy intensity of 16 kBTU a square foot. Now, that's pretty scary when you look at somebody and said, whoa, I, I just built a building in it was 32 kBTU square foot and it was lead platinum. Well, okay, well now I'm asking you to build me a building that's half that. Uh, that seems pretty damn aggressive, but plenty of buildings have done it. And now what we need to do is stop looking at this building and start looking at these buildings and saying, what did they do differently? So the first thing to do is go back and say, what size, how much energy can I produce? That's how much energy can, I can produce, then that's my energy budget. So we need to do the math. And here was the math that we had on our home. So the first thing we did was through, um, through some historic data that we had on the house, we saw how much energy the house uh, uh, ha you know, had been producing over a year. We looked at uh, PV Watts data and we found that uh, on an average year, it was about 9,100 kilowatt hours per year. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then we, we took that, we accounted for some variability. So we multiply that by, you know, 0.9, which is reducing it by 10%. So it gives us 10% variability. So which says that our energy budget for this house is, uh, is 8,190 kilowatt hours per year. That's our budget. And then we start from there and saying, okay, how do we get all of the comforts of a modern home within that budget? And when you start looking at it that way and forget about everything that <laughs> was learned in architecture and engineering school. And it's perhaps because I didn't go to school for architecture and engineering that, that I was able to look at it this way and say, all right, that's our budget. I can't use any more. I didn't know it was not possible. So it didn't even phase me. Uh, so our energy use intensity was 18.6 uh, kBTU per square foot. The average home in, uh, in the US is 62 kBTU per square foot. If I had known that when we started, that the average is 62 and we needed to go to 18, that would have scared the crap out of me and I probably wouldn't have thought it was possible. Now I'm seeing across the globe that in every climate zone, people are achieving these type things with very, very simple off the shelf. It's simply putting all these things together, all the component parts into a complex system that as a whole is complex, but at its root is really nothing more than a bunch of simple parts. So right away, we started decentralizing our thinking away from the envelope and the HVAC to how does the house use energy? And first, by, and we have all of the same appliances that every other home has. Um, we just buy, when we buy them, we buy the most efficient in every single category, the television set, the microwave, everything. And I want you to take note of that clock radio down there at the lower right corner, because we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, so here's how our breakdown from uh, for, for this year. Now, again, this was uh, during a polar vortex year. So the geothermal in the gray there used 57% of our total energy. And so you can see this breakdown, what is using energy and, and, what's, uh, uh, and what's important to really target. Um, in a normal year, we would have used less than 57% in the geo. This, this year was a bit more because of the weather. But uh, our washer and dryer, the fridge, our induction cooktop, if you look at these things, it's 12%, 4% for the fridge, 5% for the induction, 11% for the heater, even though we have a very, very efficient heater. The heating and the, uh, and the heating, cooling, and hot water are still our largest loads because we don't have an envelope that can really lower that number. In a new building, these numbers are 
almost always the reverse. The heating and cooling loads in net zero buildings are less than half of the loads now. So whereas lighting and other and plug loads used to be part of the problem, they are now the problem for net zero energy buildings. So it's really looking at these plug loads because uh, what we did was since we didn't have a choice of getting a tighter, a, a better envelope, a code built envelope because it was a historic home, we had to start with the biggest energy consumer, which was our Mueller Climatrol furnace. So we felt it was important to go with absolutely the most efficient uh, uh, ground source heat pump that we could find on the market. Um, and for us, that was that was water furnace that worked for us. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, our ERV, same thing. We wanted a recovery unit that was the most efficient. So this is a 95% heat recovery. Some of them go down to 80% uh, heat recovery. And everyone says, well, this is only 100 watts, but that 100 watts over 8,700 hours a year adds up to a lot. Uh, you can run a couple of television sets off of, uh, off of the energy savings from just your recovery ventilator. The water tanks, we went from standard elect, uh, uh, electric resistance uh, water tanks for storage for the geothermal desuperheater and, the, um, uh, and our hot water. And when we upgraded those, we saw a reduction in kilowatts of 50% by, have, by putting in a heat pump water heater. And, and I do wanna note, the heat pump water heater in a climate like ours is awesome in the summertime. Like right now we have it in heat pump only mode and we are getting more hot water than we will ever need. We have a hundred gallons of hot water every single day for a family of four for a fraction of the energy cost uh, that other folks have. In the winter time, that heat pump is gonna be pulling energy and heat out of the air in the basement. We do not want to be cooling our, our basement down in the winter. So we actually have it set uh, in a uh, in a mode where the heat pump is only turning on when the temp when the ambient temperature in the basement gets over a certain temperature, so the heat pump doesn't run very much in the winter time. And but we're still getting plenty of benefit from that from the rest of the year. Uh, smart thermostats is another big part of it. So you start with the most efficient product, and then you optimize it with a smart algorithm to get you the best level of comfort for the lowest level of energy possible. Uh, well, I call this the Snooky syndrome, right? The lights are on, but nobody's home. California and all new construction requires occupancy censored lights. I don't know why this isn't standard everywhere. It's better for the homeowner. It's not that expensive. Um, you know, on a new build, it might add a thousand bucks to the cost of the house to put these in. Uh, uh, the occupants love it because you leave the room and after you're gone, the light will turn out if you don't come back. But uh, it's like they're lighting your refrigerator. Do you really give a damn that the thing turns off automatically when you're not there? No, of course not. In fact, you're happy that it did it on its own without having to rely on the occupant's behavior to turn that light off. So this is one of these simple no-brainers. And then again, starting with LED lights, you're already at a lower energy consumption, but you shouldn't be wasting LED energy or efficient energy any more than, uh, than any other kind of energy. So let's go back to my clock. This was my clock radio that I got in law school in 1992. And up until last year, I still had this clock. And I never worried about it because it was only 10 watts. But I looked at that and I was like, wow, you know, 10 watts throughout the year. And when we had all these energy monitors and I was looking at our bedroom and this baseline energy that was being used in our bedroom, you multiply that by 8,760 8, hours in a year, and we discover that our television set is using half the amount of energy of our clock radio upstairs. That was inexcusable. So we immediately uh, unplugged that clock radio, bought another more efficient one that uses virtually zero um, uh, energy when the radio is not on. Um, so uh, our Christmas lights, same thing. Uh, it was funny because when we looked at the Christmas lights, that's not our house, by the way, but uh, LED Christmas, Christmas lights on our front porch, even though we have them on a timer, we discovered that our lawnmower actually used less energy than the Christmas lights on the front porch. And again, the reason is, is really to focus ourselves on uh, time over energy. In other words, the lawnmower uses 700 watts when it's running but it only runs for 30 to 45 minutes at a time, maybe a dozen, couple dozen times a year. So the, the energy use is high, 
but the time that it's multiplied by is very short. Whereas if you put a clock radio or a pump for your well water or whatever that is, uh, or your Christmas lights, and you say, oh, it's only 100 watts for that pond pump that I've got. It's only 10 watts for that radio. But if it's on for 8,700 hours a year, you're using a lot of energy. So you really need to pay attention to this time over energy for these for these items. And this is a big one in the in Michigan. We call this the deer fridge. You go to the garage sale or you take your old refrigerator and you go, that's ah, free. I'll just stick it in the garage and I'll keep my deer in there. Uh, I actually saw somebody that had an entire freezer filled with hot dog buns. It was a floor to ceiling stand up freezer filled with nothing but hot dog buns. And I, And they said to me, uh, well, we, we have this barbecue every June and we got these on sale at Costco. They were 60% off and they're practically free. So we thought we'd buy them. I said, you know, it, it's January, right? Yeah. When's your barbecue? In June. So you're going to keep this, frid this freezer running for six months to keep your discount hot dog buns in there. And I did the math for them on this refrigerator that they had since 1990. Or I'm sorry, they bought it on Craigslist for $40. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, at 1,200 kilowatt hours, the, the the energy used over a year is more than what they would save in those ridiculous hot dog buns. So get rid of the deer fridge. The new refrigerators that Whirlpool has, their top of the line largest residential refrigerator that they sell uses only 60 watts right now. So that's a fraction of the energy. So you could actually have several of these refrigerators for the energy cost of one of those deer fridges. <clears throat> the other big thing that um, uh, Water Furnace has in their geothermal system and another thing is what I call fault detection. So in commercial buildings, we recommend always installing fault detection systems. For residential, we want to make sure that the products are being manufactured with some sort of fault detectors. So if your, your refrigerators now, the newer ones, uh, uh, and washing machines, they actually have things that will alert you by a text or on an app on your phone that says, hey, your dryer duct is clogged, so I'm shutting down right now because this is not operating efficiently. So you go home and sure enough, you get, you look in and the, and, the, and you didn't clean out the, 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 the dust thing or whatever it was. And so it's preventing you from wasting energy. Again, designing to the behavior rather than changing the behavior to meet stupid design. Um, so this is an example of uh, January of, uh, I think it was 2012. If you look at this this green, this is our energy consumption each month in the green. Blue is our energy production. That January, now you saw uh, last year we used less than 8,500 kilowatts for the whole 8,500 kilowatts for the whole house uh, kilowatt hours. Uh, that year, just in January, we used 2,500 kilowatt hours, and it was because there was a fault in the geothermal system that took us three weeks to diagnose. Uh, our, our system is now eight years old. The, new, the same model that we have uh, for, uh, from Water Furnace now comes with a built-in fault detection that would have alerted our HVAC contractor right away when something was wrong so that they could come in the next day and get that repaired. Instead of wasting literally uh, a, a three months worth of energy over a three-week period. Now, you imagine in a commercial scale building, the impact that this has by failing to have fault detection. So it's, uh, it's a, it's, it, 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 these are very expensive add-ons uh, to whole systems or to products, uh, and you should definitely source and spec products that have fault detection in them. Uh, the old school appliances. Now, these, some of these look new, right? That refrigerator on the right looks new. The, the washing machine on the left looks pretty new. Our washing machine that we bought eight years ago was a first generation high efficiency washer. But because it wasn't designed to, uh, to spin at those high speeds, the thing died pretty quickly, which we were very fortunate because the new models actually have things like fan mode. I'll show you some of these. So this is a, uh, the, the, the new uh, dryers in uh, Europe actually have heat pumps. So they save 60% of the energy. That's in the center there. That's our induction stove. And by the way, this was our. This is a picture of our original uh, Magic Chef stove from 1969 that was in our house. Uh, that was using about 1,800 kilowatt hour equivalent uh, when we converted it from BTUs. 
this is the uh, Whirlpool double oven convection induction stove that actually has a higher, double the energy output at the top end. So you could boil water in a fraction of the time uh, as the gas stove. And it could actually go down low enough to where you can use it as a double boiler uh, and melt chocolate directly on the stove without the need for putting water or anything like a double boiler on there to even out the heat. So you have a greater range, greater power, and the energy cost of this was about 400 kilowatt hours per year as opposed to 1800 kilowatt hours per year. So it's anywhere between a, uh, a, you know, a 50 to 75% reduction in energy. And then this next generation of refrigerators that, the, that uh, 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 some folks are working at in some design competitions are things like phase changes, where the compressor in the refrigerator might only have to run once a day um, during off-peak hours to keep all of the food stored and cold. And again, using 60%. So we're getting better and better, same service, less energy. Um, and so uh, it, it's getting easier and easier. And net zero energy is becoming standard. Germany has set a goal for the entire country to be powered by renewables by 2030. Uh, California code is requiring that by 2016, new homes be net zero ready. Uh, by 2020, they must be net zero. Uh, and I can't remember if it was 2025 or 2030 that commercial buildings will have to meet the same standard. So if we look at this and we really think about this, that a home in Bakersfield, California, in, uh, in 2020 will, will be built as a net zero energy home. If it doesn't, it's, it's going to be illegal. On the other side of the border in uh, Nevada, you could build a lead platinum home that's not net zero energy. But think about that. That means that that lead platinum home wouldn't even meet code in Bakersfield, California. So we have to remind ourselves that this is leadership in uh, energy, uh, energy and environmental design, right? Or maybe we need to start calling ourselves EED because that leadership role is disappearing if we're not even meeting code. So this is standard stuff. Uh, net zero energy is, uh, is being accomplished by the, um, by, uh, the U.S. Army has set a, uh, a net zero energy goal. Uh, in 1994, um, Interface Carpet set a net zero goal. Uh, Walgreens, all of their new buildings, they're starting to set a standard that all of their new drugstores will be net zero energy. Walmart has set a net zero goal. Ikea has set a net zero goal. All of these places have set net zero energy building by building or, or, uh, or system wide. Google, also net zero goals. Uh, so you're starting to see this happen over and over again. You're starting to see developers who are becoming exclusively net zero energy. In my own consulting firm, we will only work on buildings that are targeting uh, net zero energy certification or full living building certification. Um, so th th it is happening. Uh, folks who are getting on board now are, are, um, are, are the ones who I think are gonna be ahead of the curve uh, in the next couple of years. And you question it, you know, is this really possible? This is a picture of a street in downtown Detroit, Michigan in 1908. Woodward Avenue in Detroit, Michigan was the first uh, asphalt paved road in the world. In 1908, there were no paved roads anywhere on the planet. Uh, Detroit, Michigan had dirt roads and a dead horse lying in the middle of the road. And then uh, 1908 was the same year that Henry Ford started manufacturing the Model T. By 2016, he had sold 2.5 million cars. And by 2020, this is a photograph of that same street in Detroit, Michigan. Who could have ever imagined the guy who picked that dead horse off the road off of Woodward Avenue in Detroit, Michigan, that 12 years later could have imagined seeing this photograph. And this is what's happening right now with net zero energy buildings. You take, you know, we're seeing it in a house like ours in a simple solid bones 1901 house with not much insulation, making it net zero energy. You've got the Birchie School in Seattle, Washington, which is net zero water and net zero energy and net zero waste. You've got life enhancing buildings like the Bullet Center, which is a multi-story office building, harvesting all of the energy that it needs on site. You've got buildings like the Omega Center. You've got homes down in, in um, uh, Austin, Texas, uh, Vancouver, Canada, uh, literally all across the country in every single climate zone, New Zealand, China, uh, Russia, um, there's an office building in uh, Lebanon, uh, Iran, 
uh, folks that are starting to do completely net zero buildings. It is no longer a challenge. And, the, and, the, and more importantly, they're being built for uh, a similar price point per square foot. And I know somebody's going to ask uh, how much our project costs. Uh, <clears throat> we're still working on this house. Um, we, um, uh, our total cost is in the neighborhood of $105,000 to $120,000 for our entire eight-year-long rehabilitation. That includes painting the house, putting in a new bathroom, new plumbing, new electrical, new roof system and solar and geothermal and all the things that it took to make us net zero energy. So all of those things are included in that cost. So this is the cost, uh, this is less than some comparable renovation costs. Uh, so you see places, this is Painters Hall over on the right, Victoria, BC, that's a net zero house over on the left. Uh, American Samoa, the EPA headquarters, a house in New Zealand. Here's a, a, a cottage in San Francisco, but I think San Francisco's cheating. Uh, you could live in a sleeping bag there quite comfortably. Uh, the Packard Foundation, here's one in Phoenix, Portland, Oregon, Pittsburgh has the, the uh, Center for Sustainable Landscape at the Phipps Conservatory, fabulous building, the Willowbrook House in Austin, Texas. And so again, you know, we're going to go nuclear, but put the power plant 93 million miles away, as William McDonough says, and then we're going to go nuts. And as Brett mentioned to y'all, we have the amazing privilege of getting to work with these extraordinary students from the University of Michigan who are actually now taking our house to what the real challenge is, which is net zero water. So stay tuned for that. You can Google some of that. You can see some videos that some of the students are doing and, uh, and really, really transforming the infrastructure of, uh, of the US. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. I've tried to leave about, it uh, looks like we've got about 10 or 15 minutes, Brett. How long do we have? Brett? Yeah, I'm here. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So yeah, yeah, we uh, we we uh, I, I, we can sit here for another 10, 15 minutes as long as as you guys would like to discuss, uh, Matt. If that's all right with you. Sure, I'll take us till the last question's answered. Yeah. So um, so if anyone's got some questions, um, comments, um, thoughts, um, just go ahead and throw them right into the chat box down there, and or if you'd like, just send me a request, and I can. Um, take you off mute and have you ask Matt um, directly. That's not a problem. And while we're uh, waiting for the, the questions to come in, I, I do have a few things to to jump start the, the conversation here. Um, and uh, uh, I, I guess a couple of the things are, um, so you, you had a, you had this recommendation to ignore uh, sort of the ways that other buildings around you are performing and kind of focus on your own building um, or own home. Um, and and um, so so with that question, what do you recommend um, besides, you know, the, the, the solar, the PV watts thing, which is a great start, you know, starting with the PV watts, understanding what, what your solar income really is. Um, okay, that's great. But then looking at the shell of the house and all the, you know, everything in it and understanding how much energy it uses, you know, where would you suggest folks um, start from just an understanding of how, maybe not how the other homes around them are using energy, but how their home is using energy? Yeah. So first, let me just correct myself because I think ignore was the wrong word to use. Um, it, it, it's, and it's not what we did. We did not ignore what other homes were doing. I think what we did ignore, though, was <coughs> things like... Uh, as a target, we were ignoring those things. So we didn't look at data and say, okay, the average home in this area uses 62 kBTU, so we can't do net zero energy. Um, so we did ignore that stuff, mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't try to make the comparison directly to these old, to to these you know older designed systems. It's not that the homes are older designed; it's that the systems, the new systems that were put into these older homes mm -hmm. in our neighborhood, were older designed. Sure. Um, so, and I'm sorry, so the question again, so if you'll repeat that, so. Um, well, you know, I, and I'll ask it again. Uh, I believe it was kind of two questions in one, and I think you answered the first part, but I did have another, I want to make sure the, the guests get to answer. So a question here from Alice, um, does your home energy use also include any sort of home office? Uh, yes, it does. And I hesitated to answer that because my home energy use for office is very, very minimal. It's basically my laptop, which uses 20 watts. So yes, it does include that. And I do spend the time at home. Uh, but that does include, uh, you know, when I'm at home and if the, the air condition needs to be on when I'm home, then we're heating an entire house, 
Um, uh, so yes, it does include that. And, and another interesting part of this is that um, we rent our house out for football weekends here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I know this is going to make some of y'all cringe because it did us too when we first heard this, but we actually get about $2,000 to rent our house for 36 hours during football games. So we gladly give up our house and go on vacation uh, uh, several times a year. So if we are away, we actually take vacations during times when we're renting our house out. So the house was occupied almost completely for 365 days. Typically when we go away for the weekend, we could turn off our water heater because the heat pump can actually easily be turned off you can turn off the HVAC system from our cell phones and have it turned back on before we get home. Um, but we didn't do that this year because uh, the home was always occupied. So not only was it used as a home office uh, and, uh, and we're home, each my wife and I are uh, home one day a week with our daughter. Uh, and, uh, and then we also rent it out. And so it's occupied all the time. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for that extra detailed um, description. And um, so, so here's another question that's coming in um, from Alice. And I think, you know, this is something that comes up quite a bit, especially in, in homes. And, you know, uh, we energy performance folks know better, but there is a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, and that's about the windows and the windows, you know, being the biggest energy um, hogs in a home. And, and so the direct question here from Alice is, you know, can you describe in more details, the storms that you use for the windows, and then maybe a follow-up, you know, yeah. about the um, the air sealing uh, strategy that you use to preserve your windows. Yeah, yeah. So that's a really great point, and I think that that was key to our envelope strategy were the windows, because that's where our air leakage was coming from. It was coming from, you know, as in the typical house, the attic, the windows, and the basement rim joist. So we spray foam the attic, we spray foam the rim joist, we got rid of that. And I, and I do want to note, the, the basement is still uninsulated. Okay, That's the other part of this. So it's a stone basement. Um, so the windows themselves actually became a real case study and a real kind of uh, one of the first that was showing proof that uh, uh, that sealing the windows is more important than any uh, uh, insulative value that the window can provide. So what we did was we first, we removed all of the existing windows and restored them. So we stripped all the lead paint off of them. We stripped the liners so that they would be operable. We put in new sash weights. And then when we restored them, we cut a kerf in the, uh, in the meeting rails and the bottom and top sashes. And we put in, and this is really easy to get. And, um, uh, you know, I, the, the name of the company actually escapes me right now, but maybe Brett, we could post it on your website where you can get some of these things, the weather stripping for there's these companies, there was, they weren't even on the internet when we started, you had to special order through people who knew better. Um, and uh, basically you can get uh, these silicon bead strips that fit into that little kerf. And it's the same stuff that they use on, on, on good brand new windows and a window like, like Anderson. Um, and uh, and then in the sides of the windows, we put in uh, some bronze weather stripping. So basically that gave us a good air seal in the existing windows. Then we put on storm windows on top of that, effectively giving us somewhat of a double pane. So we had some air trapped in there. Uh, and on the storm windows, there's low E glass on that. So the heat stays on the right, on the correct side. And, uh, and then that, and that's also well weather sealed. So the, uh, the wind themselves, they're, they're aluminum. They're, um, again, very little thermal value, but what it does do is give us a great seal. So those are trap storm windows manufactured here in Detroit uh, from the same family that's been doing it since the 1920s. Uh, and, uh, you know, that has, and they're, they're sash storms, so they can be easily removed and cleaned and everything else, and they move up and down, and the screens are there. So they're very convenient for us. And, uh, and then it's just uh, uh, a silicone seal all the way around, just uh, the, the, the um, uh, you know, just the caulking, basically, uh, that's put around those. And then, uh, and then we did the, the, the blower door test before and after to show that there was an extreme, extreme reduction just from the windows alone. So that air seal number that you saw earlier of uh, 4.75 um, was uh, was just a reduction from the windows, them, windows and storm windows. 
Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, that's really great to hear. You know, I, I think there's this, I, this, this idea that you have to, you know, replace your windows. Um, and obviously, the cost of that can be crazy. And unless you've got a massive, you know, hole in it, um, you know, if your strategy isn't necessarily to get new windows, um, you know, you can take all these other measures. Some of them are do-it-yourself. Um, I know I have those storm windows as well from Detroit, and and they work fantastic, and also allowed me to preserve our old uh, old windows as well. Um, Another question that came in here um, from Bob is, uh, what kind of automation did you use? Cell phone control, question mark. Yeah, well, but you know, it's the Internet of Things now. Virtually every new appliance um, comes with uh, an app. Um, so uh, Whirlpool has their, um, oh gosh, I forgot what they're calling it, but some uh, third sense, sixth sense, sixth sense technology or something like that. Um, so for, for our stuff, our Ecobee thermostat, uh, we can control through our cell phone. So that's, that controls the HVAC and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, and the ERV. Um, we have a, uh, we can monitor, uh, our, uh, energy through what's a uh, e-monitor through site sage. It's a powerhouse dynamics is the company. Uh, and I think they've changed the name of the product to site sage. And um, our Chevy Volt, uh, we can start it from an app through OnStar. Again, that's available in any car, not just the electric cars. Uh, the, um, uh, the lights turn off by themselves. There are things, there are apps, there are light bulbs, actually, that can be controlled from apps now. Uh, that's really neat, um, and that's great stuff, but I, I don't think that's absolutely necessary. If you've got money to burn, those are fun to have. And I think this the early stage of, of this automation is actually kind of out of control. People are not using it necessarily to use less energy. They're using it as a toy. Uh, it's fun. Hey, look what I can do with my lighting. I can set mood lighting. Uh, in the meantime, they don't ever program uh, the lights to turn off, and the lights aren't on occupancy sensors. So it's not really saving any energy. It's just cool to show off to friends at cocktail parties. Uh, and the same thing, you know, starting your car uh, with your app, it's great fun, but you're not saving any energy by doing that. Um, but, but at the same time, things like uh, the washing machines that give you fault detection through your cell phone, that's great. Um, if we have an issue with our, our filters on the geothermal, we do get alert through, uh, through my email uh, and through the app. I can see on that and on the thermostat itself. So three different places I will be alerted if something's going on with the uh with our with our uh geothermal so we would know right away if something's happening so uh these are pretty valuable things awesome um and uh another question here and and this one is great and i'm going to add to it a little bit because i i know you um had, uh, your renovation is in a historic uh, district, um, which many may find their existing homes in a historic area, um, and there can be some challenges to going green. So, along with the historic piece, you know, the, the question is, how was your experience with the regulatory agencies uh, in the city in in permitting? Um, you know, were there any major lessons learned um, or cro crossroads in in partnering to um, work with code officials to get to net zero? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I don't think there should be any issue or conflict between historic homes and going net zero energy. In fact, the two are completely compatible and they're, they're really no different than any other kind of existing home. And the strategy should be the same. Um, I, where we, the only time we ever had to deal with, uh, there were actually there were two. Uh, we were applying for a grant uh, or tax credits for a historic rehabilitation uh, through our state historic preservation office. We were denied because we used spray foam in the attic. Uh, they made all kinds of cases based on some information from 1978. I was literally stayed up till midnight reading their entire thing. And I'm like, where are they getting this? And I went back and I sourced it and it was 1978. And I was like, I cannot believe this. So over a, over a year and a half, we went through an appeal process with them and we did win. Uh, and we told them that uh, their fears were misplaced, that, uh, uh, that spray foam in the attic was perfectly fine. It wasn't going to destroy the historic integrity of the house. It was removable, which was important to them. You can remove spray foam. Uh, and if they were concerned about it, I said that they recommend that they put um, some sort of uh, just lightweight barrier. Uh, it could be paper, frankly, uh, on, the, on the roof and then spray over the paper. So that um, 
because uh, you're 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 within the air barrier anyway, so you're you don't need to worry about mold or anything with the paper. You're going up against wood. Um, so uh, if it ever needed to be removed, you could uh, remove that stapled paper and the um, on the stuff, and they have this clean wood underneath. Uh, so there was a number of silly things like that, but uh, we're, I, honestly, I think we're past that. I think the historic preservation community in the past few years, because of our house and some other issues have, have, uh, in preservation green lab, um, uh, you, if y'all are interested in some of this preservation things, uh, preservation, Google preservation green lab, they're part of the national trust for historic preservation. Um, they're based in Seattle and they're doing some extraordinarily compelling work and making the case for restoring America's housing stock and existing buildings uh, to be more energy efficient. Um, and, uh, and then our solar panels, we had to get approval from the Historic District Commission, um, which I actually agree with. I don't think people should be cladding the front of their homes with, uh, you know, like we said in the beginning, you know, uh, a, a flower is place-based, but it's beautiful. It can't move to get its food or its energy or its water, but it's beautiful. And a home should be too. And we shouldn't be cladding the front of these houses with a solar panel just to get our energy. Um, so uh, we were approved unanimously by the uh, Historic District Commission here in Ann Arbor. Uh, we used black on black sun power panels so that they kind of blended in with the roof line. And the greatest compliment that we get from neighbors is people who have walked by for years and never noticed the solar panels on the roof. Um, so, and that's really what we're going for. I don't think solar panels should be there as an advertisement. Um, uh, it should, it should be beautiful and, uh, and designed into the building. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I know with, um, w with solar, we, um, you know, we're working with a couple of folks over here in neighborhood associations and, uh, there is a, there is a big issue, um, with the idea of the, of the solar, uh, looking bad. And there are many neighborhood associations that don't allow it. So there is a lot of room for yeah. conversation, um, um yeah. you know, certainly all over the place. I, I have, to, I do want to add that I strongly disagree with all of these prohibitions against solar in historic districts, neighborhood associations or whatever. Um, these strict blanket prohibitions are absolutely ridiculous. The fact that we allow asphalt roof shingles and vinyl siding, but not solar panels is just abhorrent to me. Um, it should be on a case by case basis and it should be based on, uh, on, uh, look, you can put solar up, but just make it look good. And there's plenty of tools now. They, they have, uh, uh, they have solar panels that are custom cut in triangles and angles to fit onto roof lines. So they'll go edge to edge. Uh, you, they have, uh, glass solar panels that are done like, uh, in the, in the, like terracotta tiles. Um, so there's, there's all, they may be more expensive, but. Uh, in the end, that's the cost of uh, maintaining our heritage and beauty, and uh, and I think it's important. But a prohibition is ridiculous. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, a couple more questions, um, and just before you know, everyone knows uh, for the continuing education portion of this, um, we'll be sending out the handout um, as well as a mini ten question quiz uh, that you'll have to just get eighty percent on. Uh, don't worry if you get a few questions wrong; you can just re-answer those questions, and we'll work with you to get your um, con ed. Um, so, a couple minutes still here. A couple questions. Um, one on geothermal uh, heating and cooling, and um, integrating a uh, geothermal system into, um, you know, an existing, especially um, more of an inner city type of home. Um, you know, what is, you know, what was the challenges to that? And, you know, would you utilize any other kind of HVAC system um, if you were looking back and, and wanted to do this now? Uh, the short answer is no, I wouldn't look, I, I, it, for our particular project, I would not choose any other system. In fact, I would choose the, the identical system that we have now with the exception of uh, all, all the new fault detection and everything else they have in the systems. Um, and some of their compressors are a little bit more efficient now, but even at, at, even going back, I would not do any, or even today, I would not do anything different. Uh, and the reason is, is because we couldn't, we couldn't improve the envelope that much. Uh, and so just from a, a strict cost analysis, getting the most efficient HVAC was very, very important. And for us, it was geothermal. There are net zero homes and buildings now that are using air sort heat pumps, even in cold climates, because we're, we're getting down to uh, extraordinary efficiency levels uh, in these air source heat pumps that are able to operate below zero Fahrenheit now um, for, uh, for, for I, I believe, for several days. Uh, so there are other 
sources now. There's a lot of options to look at for HVAC for net zero energy buildings. Uh, for us, we put in a three ton unit in a you know 1500 square foot house, uh, 2600 square feet of uh, uh, of uh, p- a- a- at least partially conditioned space. So in that 2600 square feet, uh, if it were a new code built house, and I'm talking code built, not even lead lead platinum we probably could have gotten away with a 1.5 ton geothermal system uh, and still maintained the same level of comfort, but used even less energy than what we use now. Uh, you know, our house knew, I think we could get away with, uh, you know, 5,000 to 6,000 kilowatt hours a year. Um, uh, so, uh, and as far as uh, challenges that we had, we didn't really have any challenges. We did vertical um, there's still a 30% tax credit. So the additional cost of drilling vertically still made sense. Our out-of-pocket expenses still ended up being about $15,000, not including the ductwork. Um, uh, so there, were, there weren't any real challenges for us. There are some properties, very, very rare, far fewer than people say or think, uh, that do have problems with geothermal. You can get geothermal into the, the, the new well rigs are, are pretty tight. And any contractors that are telling you that geothermal isn't possible on a piece of property, get two or three more quotes and you might find otherwise that uh, folks with the right drill rigs can get in, even onto a, even onto a narrow urban lot. Uh, it's, it's been impressive where I've been able to see even commercial developments getting into geothermal into a narrow alleyway uh, and, being, and being able to drill enough wells for an entire building. So... Well, thanks, Matt. Um, any, uh, I, I guess, any kind of uh, before as we wrap up here, any any final thoughts? Um, yeah, oh boy, so many final thoughts. But uh, most importantly, I, I really hope that people took away from this that uh, uh, two things: that that first, net zero energy is something we 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 have to do. And um, one thing I didn't mention was scale jumping. And I think there's probably a lot of folks in there saying, well, I've got trees or this project that we're working on. It doesn't really have the solar capacity. And when we talk about net zero energy, we do include scale jumping, which means being able to use adjacent or nearby properties to provide energy to that property. And so neighborhoods as a whole and communities could be net zero as a whole. Um, but at the end of the day, we, it, th- th- this, this is no joking around. We have to stop using carbon for our buildings, period. Combustion of all types. And that includes wood. Somebody said to me, well, we could just go back to living in yurts again. And I asked the question, well, if we went, if uh, all 130 million single family homes in America moved into yurts, how would we heat them? How would we cook? Uh, you know, there's not enough wood in America to heat and cool 130 million or heat and cook inside of 130 million yurts. So we really do need to, to, uh, to, to look at this modern technology and uh, look at what we've done in the past as far as really paying attention to the, to the environment around the buildings and then moving forward with the technology that we have to make these the most energy efficient buildings that deliver the same services uh, as buildings in the past. Um, so it's possible. Uh, and it's necessary. Uh, those are the two things I think I'd like everybody to take away from it.